Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight for the Aeolian Talks edition of London Fanshawe All Candidate Debate. And it's a pleasure to see all of our candidates up here on stage. This is an important, uh, you know, democratic right that we are going through right now. We are only a few weeks away from the election on October 21st. Oh, exciting times. It's been an eventful campaign thus far, and certainly things will not be slowing down from here on out. So it's exciting, and thank you all for being here tonight, and thank you to Aeolian Hall and all of our volunteers. I won't spend too, too much time on introductions because, first of all, our candidates will be coming up to introduce themselves. And I know that Andrew uh, very handily introduced our media panel, but I'm going to do it just one more time. We have Craig Needles, host of The Craig Needles Show on 980 CFPL Global News Radio, Sarah May Chitty, a freelance Anishinaabe journalist and educator, and Pat Maloney, digital editor with the London Free Press. So thank you all for taking time to be here this evening. Okay, so without further ado, we'll do a quick little rundown of how this evening is going to work. We'll have candidate opening statements. They will each have one minute to introduce themselves to all of you. They'll come up to the podium to do that, and then the rest of the evening, they'll take their seats here so you can better see them as they answer questions from our media panel. It'll be broken down into several sections. We have a few different topics to discuss tonight, and the first topic will be the environment and climate change after our opening statements. So enough yakking from me. We will I'll ha rather ask our very first candidate to come up, and that is Mr. Mohammed Hamoud from the Liberals. Thank you very much. My name is Mohammed Hamoud, and I'm the Liberal candidate for this community. When I decided to run about eight months ago, I always started knocking door to door. I had no idea how overwhelming this responsibility would be. It gave me a good opportunity to listen to the people of London Fanshawe and to understand their needs and what they needed. It gave me the opportunity to listen to, to understand, and it's giving me the opportunity to listen so that I can support. From then, I wanted to align myself with a party that had vision, to make a positive difference, a progressive change to the lives of people in this community. If elected the Member of Parliament, I will work relentlessly to continue listening to people at the door, to listen to people and their concerns, and to amplify those concerns where decisions are made in our nation's capital. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Bella Kosian from the People's Party of Canada. Hello, everybody. Okay, I'm a little bit small. My name is Bella Kosoyan. I am running for People's Party of Canada. I have degrees in political science, international relations, and law degree. I grew up in Soviet Union, where we did not have basic freedom. We did not know that, much, that such concepts even existed. Our media, our speech, our economy, our legal system were under party control. Here in Canada, our rights are supposed to be based on what is reasonable in a free democratic society. Those in power are increasingly refusing to see reason or even uphold fundamental principles like transparency and rule of law. PPC has a unique platform, which includes lowering taxes, respecting constitution, eliminate Ottawa's meddling into provincial jurisdictions, reform equalization payments, replace government control of supply management, balance the budget in two years to stop our skyrocket debt. The People's Party of Canada is the only party that is running on a platform for fiscal responsibility and accountability. Thank you. Bella, thanks for bringing the mic down for me because I, I was up on my tiptoes there for a little bit. Next up, we have Lindsay Matheson from the NDP. Hi, I also appreciate that she brought the mic down. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay Matheson, I am the NDP candidate in London Fanshawe. Politics are about choices, and everyone must look at the track records of the two parties who have governed this country for the last 152 years. The choices leaders make and the actions they take have been very one-sided, and it certainly isn't your side. For 12 years I have worked with members of parliament on issues that impact people. Issues like international trade that affects jobs here in London, human rights, indigenous affairs, and legislative protections of our fresh water. When you need help, New Democrats 
Democrats have been in this community working hard for you. I am a proud member of that team. I know what that dedication to our community means and the difference it can make. I've seen it firsthand. This fall's election is our opportunity to start to fix what's broken and to build a better future for everyone. Let's make London better together. On October 21st, vote for an NDP MP who's in it for you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Michael Van Holst with the Conservative Party. I'm Michael Van Holst. I've devoted the last five years to be the full-time city councillor for Ward 1. I know how the city works and what it needs. And what that is is help with the challenge of unemployment, poverty, homelessness, addiction, and mental health. It's like a fist that punches London in the head, and we need an advocate to go to higher levels of government and get that help for us. When I looked at the pile of things I was able to get for my own struggling area, Hamilton Road, I realized I was that advocate. I'm also pleased that our Conservative Party has a real plan to protect the environment, to live within its means, to put more money in your pocket, and to help you get ahead. Every politician talks, some take action, a few get results. You know from my record that I'm able to get results. So I hope you'll support me on October 21st and we can get some things done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next, we have Tom Cull from the Green Party. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Cull. I'm excited to be here with my fellow candidates to talk about your priorities for the upcoming election. A little bit about me. I'm a contract professor at Western. I've taught in the American Studies, the History, and English departments. I'm a community organizer, and I've served on the boards of the Urban League of London, Words Fest, and Poetry London. I'm also the city's past um, poet laureate. Uh, in that job, I worked with uh, young and emerging artists from across London. I'm perhaps most proud of the monthly cleanup group that I started seven years ago with my wife Miriam. Over the years, we've pulled tons of garbage out of the river. We've worked with Londoners to improve water quality and improve hab uh, river habitat. I now feel called to run for public office. I believe that now more than ever, we need leaders who put their communities first and who are ready to work across the aisle with all parties to address pressing challenges of climate crisis, affordability, job stability, and truth and reconciliation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I have two thoughts after our opening statements. One, everyone is very on time and I like it. <laughs> Paying very close attention to Andrew Rosser's cues on time. And also, I feel like I got in some extra steps walking back and forth from the podium. So my phone's keeping track of that. Okay, so our introductions are done. We are moving on to the main event and that will be our first topic. So how this will work is our panel of esteemed <laughs> journalists and guests here, they will ask a question each for the bulk of these categories. I'll let you know if that changes. So we'll move through the panel. Each candidate will have uh, a minute to answer the question. If there is anyone who wants to, uh, you know, if they make a direct challenge to another party, another candidate, there will be an opportunity for a 30 second rebuttal. Again, we're keeping close on time here. So we do have a bell that will sound if we're, Andrew? We're not joking, we're not kidding around. <laughs> so that will sound and that will say, mm, time's cut, you're, you're done and we're on to the next thing, okay? All right, so first topic, the environment slash climate change. And our first question will come from Pat Maloney, I believe. Hello candidates, um, speaking generally, how do you balance the environmental benefits of a carbon tax with the economic toll that that could force on companies, for example, to cut jobs or even move elsewhere outside of Canada. And our first response will come from Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. Sorry, could you please repeat the question? How do you balance, generally speaking, the, the, the environmental benefits of a carbon tax with the economic toll that one could have, for example, forcing companies to potentially cut jobs or leave Canada altogether? Right. There is a price on pollution, and this is something that the Liberal Party believes is necessary. People in our demographic, in my demographic, haven't quite gotten into accepting that we have a climate crisis. When we listen to our youth, when I sit at the table with my children, 
I understand that this is a crisis and we need to address it now. The important thing is to know that if we don't start taking action today and supporting the community and putting steps to prevent further damage to our environment, we're not going to have a place where our children can actually continue to survive and to thrive. So with regards to have helping businesses and how they can, um, re how they can uh, put up with the carbon tax, again, this is to encourage them to work towards reducing emissions, something that the Liberal Party wants to see happen by 2050. This is why we put a very ambitious plan, but we believe that our investment in the future is well worth it for our youth and our future. Thank you very much. And now to Bella Kosoyan of the People's Party of Canada. Okay. It's undisputed that climate change is happening, but there is no scientific consensus that uh, on the theory that CO2 produced by human activity is, is causing dangerous global warming. So the United Nations Security got a letter, 500 scientists signed, and they told there is no climate emergency. Letter was sent a couple of days ago. So People's Party of Canada will withdraw from the Paris Accord and abandon unrealistic greenhouse reduction targets. Stop spending billions of dollars to sending to other countries to help them to reduce their emission. Abolish carbon tax. The protection of the environment is a shared jurisdiction with the provinces. If provincial governments want to adapt programs to reduce emissions, they can do it. Invest in, our party is proposing to invest in adapting policy strategies if problem arises as a result of natural climate change. Prioritize the implementing of solution to make Canada safer. Thank you very much. And now to Lindsay Matheson with the NDP. Um, I think that we, we need to make life more affordable and taking action on climate change can happen at the same time. Canadians want to do their, their part to fight climate, climate change, but I know that they are struggling with the rising cost of living. Um, I don't think that you can, you can uh, change this world without taking those bold moves. Uh, the carbon tax is just one tool, but um, in our plans, we want to ensure that life is more affordable by investing in housing, invest, investing in retrofitting, investing in in a, a clean uh, economy that, that prepares people for the future and those good jobs of the future that can be through um, zero emission vehicle builds and um, a cleaner transit system. So it's about shifting the environment and the economy, building it together and making sure that, that people in our, in our communities have those good paying jobs to go with it. Thank you very much. Michael Van Holst now from the Conservative Party. Thank you. The, the answer to this question is really easy. You balance this by getting rid of the carbon tax and using the economy to solve the climate problem, and that's our conservative approach. What we want to do is focus on green technology in, instead of taxes. So by using Canadian technology to, that we can export to other countries to leverage the changes we can make here. For instance, uh, there's a, a company in London, Ontario, that has got a new wastewater treatment uh, strategy. Uh, it will cut the city's energy budget by uh, 25%. If we could have other countries that are big emitters use that technology, we can have a huge effect on the climate while having a strong economy here by exporting our technologies and keeping the jobs. Thank you very much. Now to Tom Cull of the Greens. So what we want to do, we need, a, we need uh, carbon pricing. Um, that's a conservative idea, actually. Um, and what it does, it incentivizes business to cut their carbon. But the, the way to do this is to stop oil subsidies and start subsidizing green technology and make Canada a hub, a center for investment, for new business, for corporations that are getting into green energy. The whole world is moving towards this. The whole world is trying to make the 1.5 targets. So that's, as Elizabeth May always likes to say, you gotta, you gotta skate to where the puck is gonna be, not to where it is. And so that's my answer, is, is the Green, has a, Green Party has a plan to invest in green tech. Uh, that's gonna be the future, and that's gonna build the economy. Thank you very much. Our next question now uh, will be from Sarah Mae Chitty, and our first respondee, 
candidate respondee will be Bellacosian. So, Sarah May, please. So, for context, um, recently a study was published by the University of British Columbia on the biodiversity of land managed by indigenous people exceeded that of even parks managed by the government. Uh, regardless of the fact, this is all indigenous land and uh, healthy land is a key determinant of our health and everyone's health. So my question is, how will you work with indigenous communities to protect land and facilitate indigenous stewardship beyond just reservations? It's about Aboriginal questions, yeah. Indian question is a complex. We know that, that injustice were committed to by Canadian government, but we have to accept it's a history. So we have to look to, together in harmony now. People's Party of Canada is proposing to replace a paternalistic Indian Act with a new legal framework that equal rights are guaranteed. Respect treaties and constitution, which will reaffirm federal government's power to approve natural resources and infrastructure projects. will explore avenues to promote individual property rights on reserves. PPC will ensure that Aboriginal communities take ownership of the services they receive in partnership with Ottawa. Ottawa spends $21 million and PPC will review federal spending to ensure that programs are better targeted to benefit the Aboriginal population. Thank you very much. And now Lindsay Matheson from the NDP. Uh, thank you so much. Um, conservation is, is absolutely a vital way that we need to protect our ecosystem and our biodiversity. Uh, New Democrats have, have said that they will protect 30% of our land, fresh water, and oceans by 2030, and backing those protections with funding and enforcement. It is key to, to um, take into account um, indigenous um, practices, and, and reconciliation is a huge part of, of making um, uh, our indigenous uh, communities a part of, and their knowledge a part of where we go and what we do. We need to ensure that we're working together. Um, they have always been stewards of the land, and we can learn so much from what um, our indigenous uh, partners and governments um, do already. I think that that's, that's key as part of that reconciliation to actually make it a part of every government commitment and every government policy going forward. Thank you very much. And now Michael Van Holst with the Conservative Party. Thank you. The uh, Conservatives' plan is to restore funding for community-led programs, and those are certainly ones that can have Indigenous input into them, and certainly a place that we should look for them. But the National Wetlands Conservation Fund, uh, Recreational Fisheries Con Conservation Partnership Program, which was canceled by the Liberals, uh, and maintain those important national conservation programs, including the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, the Natural Heritage Habitat Stewardship Program for Species at Risk. All these things are, are potentials for cooperation. Thank you very much. And now to Tom Cull from the Green Party. Um, the way to protect the land is to protect the traditional land protectors and water protectors. Um, I think the first thing that we need to do is harmonize our laws with the United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Peoples, and we need to immediately adopt uh, the calls for action from the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission and the report from the murder and missing Indigenous women and girls. Uh, that's how we start, uh, and then we keep working um, together in consultation, and we listen and we follow uh, uh, the lead of Indigenous peoples um, who have the knowledge that we need to um, ensure that we have a livable planet. Thank you very much. And now to Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. On the one hand, I believe that we have to engage in ongoing consultation with our indigenous, with the indigenous uh, peoples of Canada. We have to recognize their sovereignty over this land, and we have to make sure that we are following up on the calls for justice for all governments. This is something that I will respond to, and making sure that we're actually um, addressing the, in, the findings that came, the, called the actions that came out of the inquiry to the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls making sure that we can continue the conversations and consultation with the indigenous peoples of Canada also means that we have to have meaningful indigenous-led action where we are understanding their contributions, where we can actually have investments into the economy and into the climate, such as the pipeline project where every dollar that is uh, 
that we will have as a profit will be reinvested into renewable energy as well as giving back to there we go. Okay. We are flying. We're doing well here, everyone. <laughs> Kudos. Well done. <laughs> All right. So our third question will come from Craig Needles. I should probably use a microphone. <laughs> Your voice is very loud, but My you still need a mic. My voice is loud, though. Yeah. I could have I gotten away without it. <laughs> We've already talked about the carbon tax this evening. I want to hear different ideas for changing the behavior of Canadians, not by force, but with incentives as opposed to not just the carbon tax, but look, we're talking about traffic in this city and there are too many cars on the road, things along those lines. How do we get Canadians out of their cars? How do we get Canadians to embrace behaviors that are better for our environment without punishing them? And our first answer will come from Lindsay Matheson of the NDP. Actually, um, the NDP have a, an excellent plan for this. It's, it's about uh, transitioning to better transit systems. Certainly London um, has had quite a, a, a debate about transit in this city. Um, and what the, the NDP believe uh, that we need to do is to move to an electrified transit system. We need to invest uh, large amounts into that transit system, but that does move people out of their cars. If you, we have a, a plan to, to work with the cities if they want to. Uh, embrace this for free transit. Um, that will eliminate a lot of the cars and a lot of the affordability in terms of what's required for people to get to work. It's about ensuring that they have that um, um, ease of transport and, 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 and access to it um, for everybody involved. It has to be, I think it has to be free in order for it to be uh, a full system. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Michael Van Holst of the Conservatives. Thank you for the compassionate question about incentives. So the Conservative Party is going to bring forward the green public transit uh, incentives. So there's a rebate that would give about $1,000 back for a family of four to use public transit. So now we're incentivizing people to do that. Uh, the other great incentive is the Green Home Renovation Fund. So that's a 20% tax credit for up to $20,000 per year of renovations for someone's home. So we're looking for people to take on the fact that homes uh, produce a lot of greenhouse uh, emissions. And we can make sure that the, the money is invested wisely because we know they will spend the money on, on worthwhile things and things with, that will be effective. And we're leveraging this $700 million to $3.5 billion in uh, effective emission reduction. Thank you very much. Bellringer, ruthless. All right, Tom Call with the Greens. Yeah, I'm not sure I see uh, a carbon talk tax as kind of, you know, twisting people's arms. Um, uh, I'm incentivized by my son's future to keep the planet at 1.5. And so when I think about the uh, carbon tax, I think it is a very commonsensical way to go about letting people choose how they want to spend their carbon. See, that's the nice thing about it is that, you know, you're not got a government in there who's uh, regulating all these little things. It's basically there is a carbon tax on carbon produced and then you choose how you want to you choose how you want to now uh, to use it now of course we need biking infrastructure we need public transportation um, we need all of these things but we also need the messaging out there um, and the framing of this problem again and again and again at 1.5 we need to hold to that or these questions about you know, what's my life going to look like, um, they're going to be um, superseded by more important questions uh, and more dire questions. Thank you very much. And now Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. So I come back to the idea that um, when, we do tag, when we do put a price on pollution, we are putting money back in the, in the pockets of Canadians. Uh, there is the deterrent that we can no longer ignore that we have a climate crisis, but we can also understand that by putting a price on pollution, people understand that this is an investment back into the communities where they live, such as with infrastructure, creating renewable energy resources, and creating ways that we can um, uh, support the community. For example, the Liberal government has given over $180 billion investment, committed to over $180 billion investment. We've seen recently $120 million committed to London to help with the light rail transit. And those sort of investments 
sometimes get people off out of their cars and into a transit system. It's money well spent to make sure that not only is our local environment, uh, local communities being looked after, but our environment is safeguarded for future generations. Thank you very much. And to Bella Kasoyan of the People's Party of Canada. Like I told, PPC wants to cut carbon tax because the protection of the environment, it's a shared jurisdiction between federal government and provincial government. People's Party of Canada instead wants to invest in putting strategies if problems arise as a natural climate change. And if we cut taxes, people are going to have more money and they are going to know how to spend their money. But we are going to put solutions to make Canada's air, water and soil cleaner. Bring clean water to remote nation, national, to first nation communities. So when we cut taxes, we are going to have more money and after we can invest to have more businesses and people are going to be more happy. Okay, thank you very much. That's our first round of questions on the environment and climate change done. That's quick and painless, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, our next topic is the economy. We will start with a question from Pat Maloney, and our first responder will be Michael Van Holst from the Conservative Party. But Pat, take it away. Okay, interesting to hear references to behavior and habits. What can be harder to change than, than a habit? Um, last year, according to Statistics Canada, the household savings of Canadians was en route to dipping to a 14-year low. Uh, generally speaking, I think most people would agree Canadians spend too much relative to what they earn. That, of course, leaves them open to all kinds of potential issues in case of an economic shop, a, a job loss, and even just the uh, pressures of re uh, garden variety retirement. So how can the federal government encourage Canadians to buy less and save more? Well, the best way to encourage something, someone to save is to give them money that they can't save. And that's what a conservative government is going to do. They're going to put more money in Canadians' pockets, and we have almost a dozen strategies to, to do that. We'll start with lowering the personal income tax rates over four years. That'll save a couple of two, about $850. We're going to increase the age credit. Uh, we're going to get rid of the carbon tax, which makes everything more expensive. Uh, take the GST off of home heating, so there's another $100. So all these things add up to more disposable income for Canadians, and that disposable income is the kind of thing that drives an economy. When our economy's going well, we've got more people working and, and more people paying taxes, more income coming in, and it's a cycle that's very positive. This is what's needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Tom Cull of the Greens. Well, uh, I think we need to look at how taxation works in this country. Um, uh, the Greens plan to uh, raise corporate taxes 5% from 15 uh, to 21. That's 6%. Sorry, my math. Um, that matches uh, uh, corporate uh, income, uh, corporate taxes, uh, American corporate taxes, right? Um, and that will uh, allow... Um, uh, Give ta allow us to give tax breaks uh, to the middle class. Now, the other thing that the Greens um, are proposing is a guaranteed living w income. So that will mean that everyone will have a guaranteed wage that puts them above the poverty line. When you're above the poverty line, you're not living in crisis, and you can see horizons of possibility and hope. And that's when you start investing, and that's when you start saving. Thank you very much. And now, Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. The Liberal Party made a promise to Canadians that, to the middle class, that they would cut the taxes for the, from, they would cut the taxes to the middle class, they will tax the wealthiest 1%, and they would help the middle class. This is why they've cut the taxes for 9 million middle class families. When we put money back into the pockets of Canadians, we allow them to save, definitely, that's one of the goals, but we also want them to be able to invest into their own futures and the futures of their children. Other measures that we've done to make sure that Canadians have more money in their pockets is we've taken away taxes, indiscriminate taxes, as, uh, credits, such as the universal child tax credit that was instituted by the previous government, and we've put something that was commensurate with how much money people are actually making, such as the Canada Child Benefit, which has lifted over 300,000 children, 25,000 of them in London Fancha alone. We've also seen that with the with the changes that we've made, there's been over 800,000 children. 
Thanks very much. Bella Kosoyan of the yes. PBC. Did you know that our debt is skyrocketing? We have $2.2 trillion in debt. How we're going to pay this if all parties just want to spend and spend? PPC wants to cut, eliminate two tax bracket from 15,000 and 200,000 is going to reduce till 10 percent. Over, if you earn from over than 100,000, we're going to reduce to 25 percent. Want to eliminate tax credit that serves no public interest. Want to expand, accelerate capital allowance to all sectors and make it permanent. Drop corporate income taxes. Want to cut taxes for farmers. And we're completely want to stop subsidized business, businesses and reduce their taxes so they can make more savings. We want to eliminate barriers between provinces. It will cost economy $13 billion a year. So by cutting taxes, more money, more job in the pockets of Canadians and London Fanshawe, because London Fanshawe is an industrial district. Thank you very much. Now Lindsay Matheson of the NDP. Um, affordability issues are, are key, and so what New Democrats want to do is put that money back into public services. We want to put money back into health care, into pharmacare, into dental coverage, ear and eye care, mental health care. Um, people have been, have been taking a lot of out-of-pocket expenses for all of these things, and then we need to save people money. We know that for every dollar that's put into public services, there's a five-time return as opposed to tax cuts. Um, the tax breaks that the Conservatives are proposing um, for a household income of $70,000, it might save people about $200. However, the London Fanshawe's median household income is $66,000. So a lot of people in fin London Fanshawe won't uh, have any benefits from this whatsoever. The New Democrats want to close tax havens and tax loopholes. That will save us $25 billion minimum um, to the federal coffers. Uh, we we want to raise the wealth tax by 1% on those who have $20 million in assets. That's another $6 billion. Thank you very much. I feel like we're all going to have dreams tonight with the bell ringing. <laughs> Kudos to the candidates for getting in their answers in that way. Our next question is from Sarah Mae Chitty, and we will start with, I believe, Tom Cull. All right, so um, it's funny because you mentioned the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Romeo Saganosh's private member bill died on the floor, notably because the Conservative Party argued the stipulations of free and prior informed consent would interfere with economic development. So can you speak to what your party, um, their policy and commitment is on this complex issue going forward? Uh, the policy is quite quite simple. It's um, to harmonize the laws immediately with UNDRIP, or United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So we will do that immediately. Um, and we don't see that as a, um, we see it as the right and proper thing to do. It's UN law, um, and this is the way forward for our nation. Um, I, I don't think I can say much more than that, other than I don't see any um, conflict between UNDRIP and the future success of our country and our nation. In fact, I see quite the opposite. I see it's the precondition for Canada to reemerge on the global stage as a, can as a country that can be proud of itself. Thank you very much. Now to Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. We need to continue consultation with Indigenous peoples of Canada. We need to make sure that they are equal partners at the table. They have the, the abilities to be involved in decisions that affect them. We need to make sure that they understand what the commitment of the Liberal government is towards recognizing the calls to action that were a result of the um, missing and murdered Indigenous and um, women and ch uh, women missing Indigenous Sorry, the missing, the MMIW. Um, the important thing is to continue the consultation and to make sure that they're equal partners at the table. Thank you very much. And now to Bella Kosoyan of yeah. the PBC. Like, like I said, uh, that uh, People's Party is con Canada is committed to look into uh, to, uh, to replace paternalistic Indian Act. We know that in Canada we have 600 communities, and we know that injustice was committed. Personally, I worked and wrote a paper about constitution, about treaties, and I know what was done. And uh, People's Party of Canada wants to have reconciliation. They want to speak about uh, <clears throat> and, and 
They want to spend a lot, uh, 25 billion dollars, which are spent on ab Aboriginal par, uh, programs. They have to be spent, and they are going to serve community of Indigenous people. So the federal government and Aboriginal administration have a responsibility to ensure that taxpayers' money is well spent. So we have to review federal funding and to ensure that prog programs are better targeted to benefit the Aboriginal population. Thank you. Thank you. And Lindsay Matheson from the NDP. Um, Romeo Sagnash's bill uh, was such a, a proud moment when we, we had it passed in the House of Commons and he has worked tirelessly on this issue. He helped develop the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People and when it died on the floor of the Senate it was heartbreaking um, for all new Democrats involved. So we would have a full implementation of the UN Declaration um, and we know that it must be legislated so that all commitments are, are legally binding. Um, we need to co-develop a path to true reconciliation um, and again that is drawing from the TRC recommendations, that is calling from the calls for justice from the murdered and missing um, women's inquiry. Um, we want to establish a national council for reconciliation which provides oversight and accountability for these um, initiatives and um, recognizing and respecting the treaties um, is, is a key part too. It, it all has to come together. Like I said before, it all has to be a full government approach to ensuring that indigenous voices are, are included. Thank you very much. And Michael Van Holst with the Conservative Party. The UN document was certainly accepted as aspirational, but um, every federal government has said that private property rights are, are not on the table. The Conservative government uh, very much is in support of the reconciliation process, but we want to make sure that the things done have real and uh, important measurable impacts on the lives of our Indigenous people. So we're going to be investing in important things such as access to housing, to health care, and clean drinking water. Uh, it's also very significant for us to make sure that, that there's an economic reconciliation that happens as well. So they need to be able to take advantage of the wealth generating uh, possibilities of this great nation. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on to our last question of the section from Craig Needles. Don't forget to pick up your mic. There you go. <laughs> and our first respondee, responder, will be Mohammed Hamoud. But Craig, ask your question first. This year, if you look at workforce participation rates in the country, you will consistently find London either at the bottom or very close to the bottom in this country. Why are we so close to the bottom and what can be done to fix it? We need to continue investing in our communities. We need to make sure that there are programs that are addressing these social housing issues that we have. We have a really, and when you look around a London Fanshawe, particularly in London Fanshawe, you see that there are many homeless people. We need to make sure that the programs that the Liberal government is putting in place, a very ambitious 10-year program that is investing over $55 billion in a national housing strategy, can address and will address the issues that people are feeling. Right, housing is a right, not a privilege. We have to make sure that the most vulnerable are not punished for what they don't have access to. We have to look at the poverty issues in the community. How do we make sure that Again, people have the abilities to become involved in the community, to get trained for getting a job. How can we make sure that? Thanks very much. And Bella Kosoyan of the PPC. Yeah, I would like to tell that by cutting taxes, it's going to bring more businesses. If we're going to cut all taxes, corporate welfare and income tax, we're going to reduce from 15% to 10 and stop subsidizing big companies. If everybody remembers Bombardier, we were paid $4 billion from 1966. And so what's happened? Bombardier got sold. We're going to cut corporate welfare. So if we're not going to, if we're going to cut taxes, 
prices, so companies are going to have more money. So if companies have more money, they are going to invest in communities, especially London, financial it's industrial region. So if they invest, they are going to, to create jobs. And uh, if you have a job, so you will be able to live, and you are going to meet your minimum. So if companies, if uh, parties are proposing to spend and spend, where we are going to get all this money? Money if we don't, if our debt is skyrocketing, so cut taxes, give uh, ta ta taxes to uh, people, businesses, and we are going to have housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Lindsay Matheson with the NDP. Um, we've had consistent or, or consecutive conservative and liberal governments who have cut taxes, and those corporations haven't stayed. Um, the liberal government has given billions of dollars. They gave five million to Windsor NEMAC, and 700, 270 people uh, went out of work. Um, they gave 220 million dollars in 2018 to Toyota, who then moved their Toyota Rav4 hybrid production to Kentucky. Um, we've seen conti consistently that um, that trickle-down economic theory does not work. And ultimately, our tax dollars um, need to be reallocated. We need to prioritize different. We need to make different choices, and we need to put that money back into public services. We also need to put it into education and retraining programs. We can do that through our employment insurance program. Um, one of the big things for a lot of people going into to post-secondary education is the huge amount of money that it costs. And so a new democratic government will also ensure that um, we won't charge interest on those loans, and then we will move to ensure that from um, kindergarten to career, uh, uh, post-secondary education, all education is free and accessible and universal. Thank you very much. And to Michael Van Holst with the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you very much. So to make sure that we've got jobs and, and that they stay, we need to have a, a good foreign policy where we've got some trade happening. It's been a disaster for us these last four years. Uh, in terms of uh, our, our farms and getting our products out to, to other countries. Uh, we also it's, need to be self-sufficient, and that's why the, the Conservative government has a plan for energy self-sufficiency by 2030. And by building a energy corridor across the country, we can create jobs and keep those in our, our own country so we're not spending billions of dollars uh, importing oil from countries like Saudi Arabia. It's also important that we have representatives that will advocate for jobs in our very own riding, such as GDLS. Okay, thank you very much. Tom Call with the Greens. So we've lost the manufacturing jobs, and we haven't gotten them back. And as a city, we haven't taken bold moves to make this place a home for uh, a new investment and for small businesses. Uh, we have great small businesses here. Uh, the Green Party wants to cap business uh, tax rates at 10%. We know businesses and small businesses are economic drivers. They're community members, they put people to work with good jobs and they're good uh, community members. So that's part of it. But it's also building a city that attracts the kind of companies that we want to come to London. We need uh, transport. We need to be making the bold social programs that attracts um, the kind of businesses that will kind of grow economy and put jobs, um, put jobs in London. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we're on to our next question in the next section, which is infrastructure spending. Gosh, we're flying through this. Okay. And our next question comes from Pat Maloney. So a question less about infrastructure dollars and more about the politics that can surround it. Um, infrastructure projects can look very good from Ottawa and then get tripped up on local dissent. I point you to London's fairly tortured bus rapid transit debate, which some of you experience more intensely than others. Um, so I want your personal perspective on this. Is it Ottawa's job to vet from a thousand yard view a project and then hand over the check to a local government? Or should the federal government have a role in discussing, maybe even directing the details of particular projects with a municipal government? And our first answer will come from Bella Kosoyan of the PPC. 
we, have, we know that we have constitution. We have separation of powers, federal government and provincial jurisdiction. So provincial jurisdiction, infrastructure is a provincial jurisdiction. So provincial jurisdiction delegates its power to municipalities. So if provinces are in debt and if provinces cannot do anything, so we, PPC was going to propose that we are going to cut taxes. If we are going to cut taxes, so we are going to have more businesses. If we have more businesses, everything is going to be done properly. So we are going to have infrastructure. Don't forget there is a constitution and we have to respect and follow constitution. Thank you very much. And Lindsay Matheson with the NDP. Um, the federal government has an absolute role to play as a full partner with cities, with provinces, on all of infrastructure programs and projects. Um, but we can, we can create new jobs and we can create a healthier, stronger community through those, those infrastructure programs. Communities could afford the infrastructure that they need to, to thrive. Investments in roads, bridges, housing, childcare, community centers can all create those good jobs and with the federal government as a central partner to it. Uh, using community benefit agreements, we could guarantee good jobs, training, apprenticeships, support for local businesses, um, that public transit, uh, again, we would ensure that uh, by working with cities, we could uh, make that free uh, across the board. It would be for the city to, to become a partner, a true partner with the federal government. Housing, 500,000 units that we want to build, including social housing, community, non, and non-housing, and or non-market housing and co-ops. Thanks very much. Michael Van Holst with the Conservatives. Good question. In our, in our own city, we're having trouble making decisions about, about uh, projects. I'm referring to some green energy investment ones where I brought forth a, a motion and, and it was passed that our, our staff is gonna come back with some best practices for green and energy efficiency, efficiency uh, investments. Uh, we've had two projects that we're going to save $600,000 a year. Uh, one had a four-year payback. We make 20, $10 million after 20 years. The other had a 23-year payback. We lose $2 million after 20 years on this. And I think our federal government can help us uh, get by those things by making those best practices and making sure that <clears throat> there's no duplication in, uh, in efforts in and having us uh, have the structure for investing wisely. Thank you very much. And Tom Cull with Greens. Uh, so yes, absolutely. And the Green Party is uh, proposing um, something called the uh, Council of Canadian Governments. And that would be a council um, that brings together municipal, provincial, federal, and indigenous governments together at one table to talk about uh, specifically you know, plans like infrastructure plans, right? We know that municipalities shoulder a huge amount of the infrastructure costs and they get about you know, 10 cents on the dollar uh, of tax. And so we want to, um, you know, we want to increase that number, um, but also we want to facilitate, um, you know, cross-jurisdictional conversations so that we can make sure that we're not overlapping on things and that we can make sure uh, that we're streamlining uh, decision-making and, of course, so that municipal governments have more say at the federal table. Thank you very much. And Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. Our government's priority is investing in the economy, supporting families, and growing communities. We understand that when we invest in economies and communities, we create jobs that strengthen the middle class, and that's why the Liberal government has invested over $180 billion towards the infrastructure in Canada. What we need to do is make sure that we're making these investments, that we're working with our partners at both the provincial and the municipal level as well. We have to also hold them accountable because we know that what happens at the provincial level and what we've seen is happening now is that there's a bit of politics playing where the money isn't actually coming through and it's not being approved once it comes to the municipalities. So we have to make sure that we're holding the various levels of government accountable and that those funds are spent accordingly. Thank you very much. Our next question now from Sarah Mae Chitty and Lindsay Matheson will be our first responder. 
So uh, particularly in the, uh, the riding that you guys are all in, homelessness is a huge issue. Um, there's various reasons why people experience homelessness. 30% of the homeless population is indigenous because of housing on reserves, but also foreign buyers, inflated market, all of these things. And it's left up to provincial or municipal governments to create bylaws, but you know, this isn't really working. So what are you gonna do about it? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, um, housing and affordable housing is a key issue in London. Um, I hear it on the doorstep constantly. So the NDP government uh, will build, uh, create and build 500,000 affordable units uh, within 10 years and the most immediate need doing it within the first five. Um, that's co-op housing, that's social housing, that's um, non-market and community housing, um, intergenerational housing. Um, we know that, again, putting that money and taking it from those who earn the most uh, and those people who put their money into tax havens specifically so they don't have to pay taxes need to pay a little bit more. And investing that money and making those political choices, putting that into um, housing needs, um, needs to happen. It's, it's something that the government, the federal government hasn't done for 25 years. They've been out of that business. Um, and it has fallen. Uh, the, f the provincial government has also cut that, that program funding. So it has fallen to municipalities, but they don't have the, the overall tax base to, to make it happen in the effective way that we need to make that happen. Saved by the bell, right in the nick of time. <laughs> then Michael Van Holst from the Conservative Party, please. I said in my opening remarks, we need help on, on this issue. We don't have the funds to do it, and we need specific kinds of housing. In uh, a, a recent meeting at City Hall, I've, I've got the city to look at new models of housing for seniors. So these kinds of things are important, and if we can get the investment from the federal government, that, that would be crucial. We need places for people who are suffering from drug-induced psychosis. Uh, we need special housing for, for them so we can treat and help them. There's different types of demographics that need uh, special, special help, and that's what's that's going to be key. So looking at each one of those and teasing apart that, that housing problem so that we can support uh, various groups will be, uh, well, absolutely necessary. Okay, I'll leave uh, guaranteed basic income aside for a second and just talk about housing. So we're proposing a housing minister, a housing minister that will help facilitate um, the kind of investments that we're going to have to make in housing. So that's one thing that we're pr planning to do. We also, when it comes to um, uh, housing in London, we need to work with municipalities to change some zoning laws so that we can build tiny homes, we can build uh, laneway housing, we can build secondary units. We have to mandate that developers make like one in five um, new uh, new units. One of them is geared to rent, uh, uh, geared to income um, uh, uh, development. Um, now. There's a whole bunch of a constellation of issues that we're talking about here: poverty and um, and uh, mental health. We are we want to declare a mental or a, a, a public health emergency around addictions and opioid and mental health. Decriminalize uh, drugs, uh, d decriminalize drug use, um, and make uh, drug use a mental health uh, concern, not a criminal concern. Thank you very much, Mohammed Hamoud of the Liberals. Now, for eight months. I've been going door to door, and one of the main things that I've been hearing is affordability. Poverty, housing, this, these are systemic barriers that have been plaguing London Fanshawe for many years. And they aren't things that we can change overnight. These are things that we have to work with municipal and provincial governments and our partners. We have to make sure that we can take the $55 billion investment that the Liberal government has committed over 10 year, an ambitious 10 year, program and make sure that we can ex address the issues that are hurting the most vulnerable in our communities. Because when we see that people don't have a home, a roof over their, their, their head, they don't have a house which is a right and not a privilege in this country, we see other things that are plaguing the community such as uh, sex crimes, such as the sex increase in sex trades. Uh, substance abuse. We see the community going down if we don't invest and we don't help the most vulnerable get the help that they need. 
Thank you very much. And Bella Kasoyan of the PPC. I understand all, po po everybody is promising housing, but where is they going to get money? Because uh, like I told, our debts are skyrocketing. So PPC is proposing, for example, when you have equalization payment between provinces and government, we have to respect constitution. If during equalization payment, when it was done in 1957, uh, that we have to go into reduced equalization payments. Only provinces which are needed is going to get it. Create parliamentary committee which is going to look into formula to evade welfare trap. And we have to give more power to provinces to decide how they are going to decide their money and reduce dependence on federal money. New formula is respect constitution. Provincial government is going to be more responsible for policy decision and fair to its citizens and accountable to all citizens for every dollar spent. We want to have houses, so we have to create business to help our people. And provinces have to responsible, become responsible to and accountable to their citizens. Thank you very much. Okay, our third question on this subject uh, comes from Craig Needles, and Michael Van Holst will be the first to respond. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities says that the infrastructure deficit in this country is over $150 billion. Uh, other organizations say the estimate could be even higher than that, some approaching even $500 billion from the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. How do we fall so, bar so far behind and how can we start catching up? Because we've seen the results mostly in other countries, but if you look at an example just right here in London, we had the sinkhole at Wellington and Dundas a few years ago. We've seen the results of falling behind on infrastructure spending. I know this is a multi-government solution, but how would the federal government lead it if you were elected? Well, the conservative government is going to be investing in infrastructure, and we uh, will we can promise that uh, London Fanshawe will get their fair share of the infrastructure spending and that the commitments made by the, the Liberal government uh, are, also, are also kept. Uh, infrastructure gaps are increased every time we build something. So when something new is, uh, is created, then all of a sudden there's another gap because that also needs to be, uh, needs to be, will need to be fixed. So it's an ongoing and escalating thing, but through good finance, good financing, uh, our city is taking a, a good, uh, is taking, taking that down. We invest 25% uh, of our, our our surpluses into the uh, infrastructure gap and have have done pay-as-you-go financing so we're trying to get away from debt and this is one of the thank you very much and Tom call with the Greens municipalities need more money um, as the climate crisis uh, deepens they're going to need even more money uh, because that's where we're going to be hit with flooding and fires and all kinds of things um, so we have to facilitate that um, you know it's 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 the case that we still put raw sewage into uh, into the river and uh, you know uh, just this week there was a boiled ed uh, water advisory at Oneida Right? This is water that's taken from the same uh, water table as Dashkan Zibi. So we need to uh, beef up infrastructure, and that means beefing up infrastructure spending, and that's going to come down to a question of uh, taxation. Thank you very much. And now Mohamed Hamoud. I agree with uh, my Green candidate in that we have to make investments with infrastructure and we have to make sure that we're addressing the climate because climate and the economy go hand in hand. When we see that we spend and we're giving money into, putting money into the communities and supporting the various uh, infrastructure projects, we need to also focus on how we are being aware of the needs of the climate, such as how are we creating more resilient infrastructure? How can we better with create uh, buildings that are withstanding changes to the climate? How can we make sure that we are working towards having net zero emissions? How can we make sure that we can have realistic uh, programs that retrofit current buildings so that we are being more aware of the needs of the climate without compromising that we also need to move forward with investing in the economy? Thank you very much. Now, Bella Kasoyan. Like I said, uh, there is no climate crisis. There is a climate change. It's cycle. And even in Alberta, we had uh, dinosaurs. 
So it means climate is changing. It's natural thing, natural process. So PPC is proposing to, uh, um, uh, to uh, there is no scientific consensus on it. So PPC is proposing to balance a budget during two years. If we're going to balance a budget, if we're going to cut taxes, if we're going to have pipelines, if we're going to equalization, eliminate trade barriers between provinces, if we're going to do it, so provinces are going to have more money. Did you know that when we, one product is transferred from one province to another province, we're paying 7% and we're losing a lot of money? It's about $7,500 for a household. So by eliminating in this eliminating these trade barriers, people are going to have more money and they are going to be able to live. And so we, communities, London, provinces and federal government is going to, they are going to have more money. Thank you. And Lindsay Matheson with the NDP. Um, well, there is a climate crisis, um, but uh, unlike the Liberals who have wasted millions of dollars on the infrastructure bank that has actually only supported two projects with loans, uh, they've been putting forward this privatization of that infrastructure, which will only cost taxpayers more money through user fees and through tolls. Um, this is out-of-pocket expenses that people cannot afford. Um, we have to put that money, we have to, we have to reprioritize where we get that money, and ultimately there have been the wealthy among us who have put their money offshore. They have used the tax loopholes that consecutive liberal and conservative governments have left open. We need to close those. $25, million, $25 billion in, in people who put their money offshore specifically not to pay taxes. That's about, again, different choices and bold choices and courageous choices that need to be made. Um, we have the ability to put that, that funding into the key and core uh, support that people need in our community, housing, transit, childcare, many other things. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I, I just have to say that anyone who's up here right now has a gargantuan task ahead of them in terms of getting all of their points in, worrying about the bell. I just, clearly I'm a talker, so I don't know how I would handle this situation. So uh, very well done to all of you. <laughs> okay, we're on to our next section, which is healthcare. That's a big one, isn't it? And it impacts every single one of us in this room at some point in our lives, either ourselves or someone in our families, our acquaintance. So certainly this is a personal one for everyone. And Pat Maloney will start off this round and Tom Cull with the Greens will be our first responder. Okay. <clears throat> a federal party leader met today with a group of doctors to discuss an unexpected or unorthodox health issue, a gun ban. And that called to mind, at least for me, the uh, handgun ban. And that called to mind, at least for me, uh, the latest shooting in London, which was this weekend on Richmond Row. Three people were shot. As my colleague at the London Free Press reported today, the accused in that case was under a court-ordered weapons ban. So what does that suggest to you, if anything, about the effectiveness of weapons restrictions and weapons bans? Uh, the weapons restrictions, and what was the last part? What does, it, what does it suggest to you about the effectiveness of weapons restrictions or bans? Um, we need weapon restrictions and we need bans. Uh, we need to make them uh, effective. Uh, the, the Green Party of Canada is saying we're going to ban handguns and uh, AR-15s AR and those assault rifles. Um, that's in our policy and it's fairly clear uh, nonviolence is one of the core tenets of uh, uh, the Green Party's belief. Um, you know, I grew up on a farm. Uh, we had a shotgun and we had a 22. Um, you know, farmers need those, uh, those fire firearms uh, for, you know, rabbit animals or what have you. There's no reason that we need guns um, and we don't need, uh, I was talking with a, a Green supporter the other day who has an AR-15 and he was not very happy with the Green policy and I'm going to sit down with him and talk to him more about that um, because he makes an argument that he's using them for sport, but I just don't think we c the balance is there. Um, I, I just don't see um, having these uh, rifles that are designed to, to, to kill people in the hands of civilians. Thank you very much. And Mohammed Hamoud. Perhaps the question could be better answered by a member of a family who has lost somebody to such a crime. I don't think then we would take the question so lightly and try to put facts and figures around it because we all want to make sure that we're doing whatever we can to make our community safer. And what we need to do, we need to have a ban to curb gun and gang violence in our communities. The Liberal government has committed over $100 million towards this, 
and I believe we have this problem here in our community, and we need to make sure that we're working with local partners that we can actually enforce and make sure that we're keeping our streets safe. You only have to walk around in the streets of London Fanshawe to understand that we're missing this safety and security structure. And we need to know that in order to fix things that have been broken for many years, it's going to require quite a bit of work and it may not be easy. Thank you, and Bella Kasoyan of the PPC. Firearms legislation must protect society from criminals. Legal framework, uh, frame arms owners deserve a legal framework and protect their property rights. Replace firearms legislation with a new legislation that prioritizes public safety and fight crime in Canada. Replace costly licensing system with efficient lifetime certification following with mandatory wetting, safety training and testing. Simple, simple possession of arms will be legalized for the certified Canadians as long as they use their lawfully and don't commit crime. Mandate that all changes to firearms regulation to be completed through parliament only. So we have to fight criminals, but people who are legally owning arms, they have to have certification. They should not be punished for it. Lindsay Matheson with the NDP. Um, hunting um, uh, rifles and, and those who are responsible gun owners for sport uh, is very, very different than the, the handguns that we are seeing more and more on our streets here in London. Uh, there's a growing ne need to deal with that, that handgun violence and unfortunately the Liberals have an, uh, had an opportunity over the last four years. They introduced Bill C-71 and unfortunately it does not go far enough in that regard. Um, we, we need to deal with a lot of the systemic issues that, that, that go into a lot of this violence, and that's, that's poverty issues, that's housing, affordable housing issues, that's mental, having a mental health strategy as part of our, our universal health care system, and an addiction strategy, um, declaring opioids as a public health emergency. All of those things come in together, and that, again, is about different priorities and different choices that we need to make as a community. Thank you very much. And Michael Van Holst with the Conservatives. Yes, the, the Conservatives will make it easy, easier for police to target the, the real source of this, which is the gangs. So gangs and drugs are the reason that these gun crimes are largely committed, and we want to go after the problem, give the police uh, an opportunity and the tools to deal with that, rather than go after uh, law-abiding gun owners. So by going after the problem, uh, we'll be able to make a difference in this. We want to make sure that people who smuggle guns in uh, go, go immediately to jail and that people who commit gun violence are there for a long time. Thank you very much. Our next healthcare-related question is from Sarah May Chitty, and our first responder will be uh, Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. Okay, so the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal found the federal government guilty of discrimination against Indigenous children because of their inability to implement Jordan's principle properly, um, which creates equality for these children in health and other services, such as housing. Um, and so as an answer to this, Sydney Blackstock's done a lot of work. She's created the Spirit Bear Plan, um, which the, uh, would hold officials such as yourselves when elected um, to eliminate these discriminatory, po discriminatory policies. So what will you do to change Change this inequality for Indigenous children in healthcare and the other unequal and inadequate policies that are determinants of their health. The Liberal government is committed to making sure that we're working with the Indigenous peoples, and we will continue. I will continue to work with them to make sure that the systemic racism that the Indigenous communities have faced for hundreds of years comes to an end. We need to make sure that we uphold the rights of all citizens and of indigenous people. I will work with the local partners, I will work with the indigenous and the Métis and the various reserves. I will make sure that we are trying to keep the families united, making sure that they're not, uh, that, that they're not um, they're separated with uh, different, with, my apologies. So, I will make sure that they, we are putting all the efforts to keep families together and that we are consulting and understanding that the most important... Thank you so much. And Bella Kasoyan of the PPC. 
federal government has duty to, to towards indigenous people. And as I told, I worked on, I was writing paper about indigenous people and it was hard question to deal with it. And our party, for example, PPC proposed that services, that money are going to be spent towards indigenous population are going to really get these communities. PPC is going to ensure that programs and money that are spent, they are going to be serving, they are going to be in the best interest of people, uh, for, of indigenous communities. So, and they, they have to work together as Ottawa and uh, partnership and other levels of government to be able to implement these programs and put them in a place. Lindsay Matheson with the NDP. Um, we absolutely need to stop fighting um, Indigenous people in court. Um, I have actually had the amazing opportunity to work with Cindy Blackstock for, for many years. Um, I, I got to, to work with Charlie Angus, I got to work with Shannon Kusachin for Shannon's Dream. Um, I worked with Jean Crowder on, on Jordan's principle, ensuring the equitable access uh, for health for, for children. We, we need to abide by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, implement the stereotype spirit of their plan uh, for fair education, absolutely, and 100%. And Michael Van Hulse of the Conservative Party. Yes, and as I said earlier, our commitment uh, to reconciliation is first to start with really tangible and real improvements, and those are access to housing, uh, to health care, and clean water. Now, as, as a chemical engineer, the clean water is one that's really important to me because that's a basis for everyone's health. Even here in London, in London Fanshawe, uh, we've got uh, companies that can help with those technologies. We can provide every community with uh, a, a mobile water treatment facility that we could ship up in a shipping container for less than one million dollars that would provide clean water for these communities and and even if they're remote uh, that that's the kind of uh, tangible thing that we need to do to start making sure that people are healthy because clean water is the basis for health thank you and tom call with the green so the Green Party would definitely adopt Jordan's principle as it's laid out uh, as one of the calls to action in the uh, Truth and Reconciliation um, uh, calls to action. Um, we wouldn't fight, be fighting it in the courts, we'd be adopting it, and then we would be trying to also work around the other recommendations that try to strengthen Indigenous health and Indigenous health models, not just, you know, um, uh, obviously fair and equal access to um, hospitals and th that kind of health but also uh, indigenous-led models on, on health as well and healing. And so we, want to, we would want to strengthen that. There's no way that um, a child, uh, a settler child, that uh, Canada or Canadians would put up with them getting caught in jurisdictional problems. Um, uh, there's no way we would put up with that. So it's completely unacceptable for an Indigenous child, um, and we would adopt uh, Jordan's principle immediately. Thank you very much. Our third question on the healthcare file comes from Craig Needles, and our first responder will be Bella Kosoyan of the PPC. We have heard many promises in federal elections past surrounding a national pharmacare program. I know on my radio show on 980 CFPL, we just had a conversation with the folks at the Heart and Stroke Foundation. They've done some polling on this and found that 90% of Canadians, in some way or another, to varying degrees, supported the idea of a national pharmacare program of some kind. Do you think a national pharmacare program is important, and do you understand why there are so many advocates pushing for it? Everybody knows that healthcare programs and has worse wait time in Canada. So to be able to reform healthcare program, we have to understand that healthcare it's a provincial jurisdiction. So to replace the Canada and the federal government was pushing uh, for uh, some conditions under healthcare act. So replace the Canada healthcare transfer cash payment with a permanent transfer cash of taxpayers equivalent value of the provinces to give them stable care of revenue. Ottawa will, will give up its GST 
and leave provincial territorial government to occupy a fiscal room. In, 2000, in 2019, 2020, GST are going to be bringing to $40 billion. So this revenue is going to be transferred to provinces. So if provinces have more money, they are going to invest more. Establish temporary program that is going to compensate poorer provinces with revenues with tax to be lower than transfer payments to be receiving. Create conditions for provincial and territorial governments. Thank you very much. Lindsay Matheson now from the NDP. Um, New Democrats have been talking and, and committing to, to a universal pharmacare program for, for decades. Sadly, uh, the Liberal governments have been promising it since 1997, and they decided to study it again uh, over the last four years and not deliver it. It's something that we are absolutely committed to. Health care and the expansion of that health care has been something New Democrats have been proud of um, since the time of Tommy Douglas. Uh, we know that... Uh, the uh, pharmacare, universal pharmacare program will save our healthcare system $4.2 billion. Um, we want to save families. We know that it'll save them $500 a year, even if you have insurance. And by buying bulk drugs through a single payer system, um, this will save uh, our, our healthcare system a lot more money. It can't be piecemeal. It needs to be comprehensive. It needs to be universal. And that's where I think we are unique in terms of the provision of that pharmacare program. Thank you very much. Then to Michael Van Holst with the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you. According to the Conference Board of Canada, 98% of Canadians currently have or qualify for a pres prescription drug plan. Now that we understand that, uh, that some uh, do not, so we're, we're looking at a, a smaller amount of people that, that need that assistance. So by redoing our in, entire approach, uh, we may be creating a bigger bureaucracy, more, uh, and taking more effort than, than we need to solve the problem. Just, just like we talked about uh, with gun control, it's not, it's not dealing with the people that don't need the trouble. Uh, we, we need to go after and, uh, and, and help people that have, have, have that struggle. And uh, that's, that's the approach that we would take. Thank you very much. And Tom Call with the Green Party. Knocking on doors in London Fanshawe, I've talked to a lot of people who are having a hard time affording their drugs. Um, it's putting them, you know, three, four hundred dollars a month, uh, and um, that is being, you know, uh, driving people into poverty. Um, and it is also increasing uh, mental health instability. Uh, we are um, going to implement a pharmacare program, um, and uh, we are going to save money by keeping people healthy, um, as Lindsay pointed out. Out. The um, uh, the cost of uh, sick people uh, it costs us our, our healthcare system our crumbling healthcare system so much money so pharmacare is the way to go. Okay, and Mohammed Hamoud with Liberals. People shouldn't have to choose between putting food on the table, buying sneakers for their children, or having to buy their medicine. By introducing a pharmacare program. We make it easier for families, we make it easier for Londoners, we make it easier for people in our community to have access to the, to the medication that they need. When we don't, what we do is build on the systemic barriers that people who are most vulnerable in our communities continue to face on a daily basis when they don't have the resources with which they need to buy their, medica their medicine so investing in a pharma, national pharmacare program should not even be a choice. It should be a given for all Canadians and for people here in London Fanshawe. Thank you very much. And that concludes the health care portfolio. We are well, well past the halfway mark, everyone. So well done. As I've said, this is not an easy, uh, an easy thing to be doing up here. Rapid fire questions going down the line. So uh, well done to all of our candidates thus far. You're doing a great job. I'll take this moment just to remind everyone that if you have a cell phone with you tonight, just make sure it's on silent, just as a precaution in case you get a, a call about a, I don't know, a hot sport tip. Maybe there's a crazy game score that's going on. Just make sure it's on silent, that's all. Just to make sure that we're uh, staying focused in the room. And I mean, the bell is going off enough. We don't need a, a cell phone dinging too. That's always a little distracting. Okay, on to our next topic, which is reconciliation. Our first question will come from Pat Maloney. And our first responder will be Lindsay Matheson with the NDP. Um. On reconciliation, Orange Shirt Day recognizes residential schools and honors their victims. Do you see value uh, 
beyond symbolic uh, value in making Orange Shirt Day a statutory holiday? Um, actually, yes, that would be a, a wonderful uh, thing to move forward with. Um, and it is about, reconciliation is just about more than, than pretty words. Um, the the uh, nation to nation relationship that we have must be, as I said, before, it must be um, across the board. It must impact all government policies and all government decisions. Um, having uh, indigenous uh, governments at every uh, governing table in all of those decisions is, is a key part of what the Democrats want to move forward with. Um, and again, it is about dedicating um, or putting into legislation um, the UN Declaration of uh, Indigenous, the Rights for Indigenous People. It's about uh, putting into uh, effect the TR see calls for action, full implementation of the calls for justice from the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry. Um, again, it's, it's about respecting the treaties, putting into place the full implementation of Jordan's principle, as we discussed before in the Spirit Bear Plan, um, creating a National Council for Reconciliation to ensure accountability. Thank you very much. Michael Van Hulst now with the Conservative. Um. Thank you very much. Reconciliation is a lot about recognition of the, the problems from the past. And I know that I was stunned to find out that the residential schools were something that were happening while I was alive. I thought Canadian Canada was a wonderful place when I was growing, growing up and had no idea that this was happening. And I've, I've gone through the the blanket exercise and uh, the, those um, those other trainings that tell us about about these things. So it's it's very worthwhile for people to know why these orange shirts are are being worn and what kind of a debt we have to pay um, in order to right right this problem. Tom Cull with the Green Party. I think a national holiday is a good idea, although I like the idea of uh, students having to go to school on this day because I think it resonates with what um, we're talking about with residential schools. Um, it's on the 30th because that's the day that the buses and the trucks would roll into reserves and take children away. Um, I used it today as an opportunity to teach my class, my nature writing class, about uh, schools, uh, residential schools. So um, I think it would be great to honor it in some very thoughtful way. Um, and a national holiday might be the way to go. Uh, Senator Murray Sinclair was in London um, on Tuesday last. Um, he's, of course, the Commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission. And uh, he said, you've got to think about reconciliation as a relationship with a loved one. Uh, you have to work on it every day, um, every single day. And I think that that's, that was a huge takeaway for me. So one day is fine. Um, one day is fine if it reminds us that it's something we should be doing and thinking about every day. There are calls to action for Canadians. Thanks very much. Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. Change needs to start with awareness. And many of us are probably not aware enough about the uh, situations that are plaguing our indigen the indigenous peoples of Canada and even here in our local communities. So I think besides talking about whether or not we need to recognize this as a national holiday, I think we need to make sure that everyone understands the history, that we are all aware of how complicit we have been and not recognizing the rights of the indigenous communities and, and allowing the systemic barriers that they face and the systemic racism that they have, uh, that has plagued their commu the, the commu these communities for far too long. So by raising the awareness, we make sure that we are educating our youth, we are educating every member of our communities why we need to live together in acceptance and why we need to make sure that these systemic barriers are taken down. Thank you very much. And now, Bella Kosoyan of the PPC. As we know that many injustices were done by, by, in the past by government of Canada towards Aboriginal people. We cannot rewrite the past, but we have to live together. And we have to live together in a harmony. So we have to recognize everything, and we have to have consult indigenous, indigenous population and make sure they, we have to give them control over their lives. 
uh, to, like I told for about individual right, property rights on the reserves. And uh, we have to make sure that um, all services are going to be received in a partnership with Ottawa. So federal government has a responsibility to recognize, to ensure that people, and water and remote communities are going to get everything. So we have to recognize our past and remember it. Thank you very much. Our next question now comes from Sarah May Chitty, and our first responder will be Michael Van Holst. All right, so um, in terms of reconciliation, it's about building relationships. So I was wondering if you guys could speak to your knowledge of and relationship with the surrounding Indigenous communities in this area, including the urban Indigenous community, but um, can you specifically speak to any meaningful recommendations that you picked up and relationships you've built professionally or personally? Yes, thank you. So in uh, Ward 1, there are many Indigenous um, people living there. And when I campaigned the first time, I could tell how disenfranchised that they felt about politics. And so what I had us do on the very first meeting at City Hall was conduct a smudging ceremony. So we in invited members of our indigenous community to, to perform that to, as a way uh, of saying we want to engage in this in this process. Um, I know in my ward also we have a, now an indigenous teaching garden at, at Dillaborough Park, and this was a project that went through the, the um, <clears throat> neighborhood decision-making, and, and I helped clear that, so that was another thing I supported. Um, and uh, most recently I've been talking with uh, members of the, the Métis Nation of Ontario, um, and, and actually, there's a concern. Thank you very much. Now to Tom Cull of the Green Party. Uh, so uh, my uh, river cleanup group, Antler River Rally, um, we changed our name from Thames River Rally to Antler River Rally to acknowledge uh, the original name of uh, the Thames River as Dashkan Zibi. That came from an Indigenous member within our group. Uh, we've also worked with Chippewa of the Thames and uh, the um, uh, doing a cleanup uh, at Chippewa. I've spoke about uh, water quality at Oneida when we were talking about decommissioning the dam uh, and at Muncie, Delaware as well. Um, in my time as a poet laureate, I organized many events and uh, over, that, over the two years that I had and I made it uh, from day one uh, a stipulation that I would never organize an event that did not have Indigenous representation. So every single event had at least one Indigenous artist I've also tried to work on my land acknowledgements, um, and so that I'm not just standing up and saying, you know, these are the traditional lands. I know that's important, but I want to always link that acknowledgement uh, to the specific event um, that... Thank you. Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberal Party. The closest uh, interaction that I've had was probably through my daughter who was taking a course uh, in her high school learning about uh, Indigenous... Uh, communities and the conversation started with um, her level of engagement and her lack of familiarity with it and I would admit that this was a lack of familiarity that we had in talking about the indigenous communities and the the situations that and the level of awareness that we have in our in our own communities. So my daughter uh, and I would talk about this every day and she explained to me what she was going through and what she was learning and we wanted to make a point of reaching out to the community. So we started by watching a movie on the various uh, spiritual um, uh, the very spiritual uh, practices within various communities, our own as well as the indigenous and how uh, we could use that as a stepping stone in our own family to learn more about um, the indigenous here in London. Okay, Bella Kasoyan of the PPC. Uh, while I was canvassing, I met a couple of uh, indigenous people. I had discussions with them and one person he did not want to vote because he was told I am in indigenous and I am not going to vote. And another person, she engaged in conversation. It was she explaining to me that she did not have Canadian citizenship and how she had to travel to the United States and how to write to MP to be able to help her. Personally, I went to, I, I went to, in Ottawa, we, we visited a place for indigenous people. We went through, uh, 
um, through courts how it works. I know about Gladio Court. I know about uh, Criminal Code, if I'm mistaken, 728 Article of Criminal Code, how when you are in jail and how they're going to be tried. And uh, like we know about Gladio Court and of how, what steps they have to follow to be able uh, to, to be judged. So, and I really personally, I would like to implicate myself in indigenous questions and, and I would like to help very much. Thank you. Lindsay Matheson with the NDP. I mean, it's going to be tough. Um, I uh, have had many opportunities in London. I've, I've visited and spoken to people at the Namor and Friendship Center. Uh, I've, I've gone to Oneida First Nation to their Remembrance Day services. Um, I've been recently, just last week, I went to Nukwikwe, um and, and visited with the women of the Positive Voice, who helps gain skills in order for a lot of these women to then go and pursue their, their um, GED. Um, when I was working for a uh, member of Parliament, Jean Crowder, for many years, I, I did so many things and I was able to interact with so many people, uh, indigenous people from different areas. I went to a TRC session and I heard uh, people's stories and their, and their pain and their struggles throughout um, the, re the uh, residential school process and it sticks to me. With me today, um, I was able to go to the AFN and, and, and we had conversations with National Chief Atlio and, and all the regional chiefs from the provinces. Um, that, was, that was amazing to me and one of the things that I was able to bring from that in my in my last job we were talking about international trade and indigenous affairs and being related to international trade and the effect on international trade thank you very much <laughs> all right our last question on uh, this portfolio will come from Craig Needles and after that question we will grab the other water jug for the candidates so we'll, we'll take a moment to twist and shout and stretch a little bit after this last question we go through so Craig have at it now there's a lot of pressure on me all of a sudden. Yeah. This has to be good. Uh, Sarah May mentioned it earlier, and I know that uh, Tom did as well, which would be there's currently a boil water advisory at Oneida Nation, uh, First Nation attempts. And that is almost par for the course as some other First Nations uh, across the country. In some places, they just do not have running water. I think this is... Uh, quite possibly the greatest shame this country has, the fact that these places are still fighting to get drinking water that comes to their homes. We've seen multiple governments of multiple political stripes, provincially and federally, try to tackle this problem with a lot of kind words and then fail spectacularly. How would you tackle this problem? How would a government from your party tackle the fact that there are still Canadians who don't have ru running drinking water that goes to their homes. And we'll start with Tom Cull from the Greens. Well, that's a big question. Uh, you know, one of the things that I would like to do um, is go to Ottawa to represent the people of London Fanshawe, but I find this issue very dear to me, working on water issues in London um, and uh, working, thinking about uh, this very question about the two Canadas that exist, you know, one for settler uh, Canadians and uh, one for Indigenous Canadians, because it's not just about water, it's about mercury poisoning, it's about housing. It's, it, you know, water gets uh, a lot of press, as it does, um, and it should, uh, but there are a whole host of um, issues. And I was thinking today about, you know, the boiled water advisory. It's not just about fixing the problem, you know, once. It's, we take it for granted that every time we turn on that tap, clear water comes out. But if you have a couple of boil water advisories, how can you ever trust that system again, right? So the question, uh, we need more funding, we need to prioritize it as what we are going to do. Um, we need to care about it and we need to follow through. Thank you very much. And Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. I remember in London, we did actually have a couple of boiled water advisories and it was intolerable. We, you know, for almost a few hours, we had to worry about how we got our water. And this is a reality that people on reserves and, and the indigenous people are living with on a regular basis. I am glad to say that since 2015, 87 boiled water advisories have been lifted and that if, the, if elected, the liberal government would actually make sure that there are no more boiled water advisories, I believe by 2023. Is this enough? We have to continue to work to make sure that the people that are most vulnerable because of a lack of proper housing, a lack of investment, a lack of communication and consultation, we have to continue to recognize that the recognition of the rights 
of indigenous peoples by respecting, by cooperating, and by creating partnerships with them. This is where we start. This is where we end. Thank you very like much. I said, hello? Uh, oui? okay. Like I said, that Ottawa is spending $21 billion on Aboriginal programs. And our party wants, and there is a little evidence that this money are well spent. So we want to create programs that we're going to make sure this money are spent and they are going to serve indigenous people and their, communi uh, their communities. So about, everybody knows about problems about clean water and, uh, and, um, and it's responsibility that it's our responsibility to make sure that taxpayers' money are well spent. We, and we will review the spending money to ensure that, uh, that programs are better targeted to benefit Aboriginal population, particular communities that have greatest needs. Thank you very much. Lindsay Matheson now with the NDP. Um, <sighs> <laughs> um, the, the amount of money that has been spent um, has been uh, minuscule in, in, in terms of what's necessary. And again, this is about prioritization. This is about what uh, people uh, in, in Canada need. And just because uh, they are on reserve, uh, it doesn't make water less of a, of a human right that's required. Um, consecutive conservative and liberal governments have spent millions on lawyers fighting uh, Indigenous people in court, instead of putting that money into the public services that require, instead of that clean drinking water that's required. So we will invest what's needed to lift all drinking water advisories in the country by 2021. Um, and this is also about ensuring that um, the United Declaration of uh, the Rights of Indigenous People is, those commitments are legally binding and, and abiding by the TRC recommendations and, and all the things that Indigenous people need in this country. Thank you very much. And Michael Van Holst with the Conservatives. Is the Conservative government is committed to move forward reconciliation with the important steps of access to housing, to health care, and very importantly, to uh, clean water. And this is a technical problem. And fortunately, in London Fanshawe, we have two companies that have the technologies that can deal with this kind of issue. So I will be advocating that we create jobs right here in London Fanshawe to get those products out to our indigenous communities all over Canada. Our sixth topic, as I said, is now human rights. And we will start with a question from Pat Maloney. And our first response will come from Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. So of course you're London Fanshawe candidates and you've shown you're very prepared for all the questions and I'm sure you'll be prepared for one about Saudi Arabia. Um, the details of Canada's $15 billion pact to supply military vehicles to the Saudis are well known of course and they're built here in this riding. Um, so you're an MP and it's up to you to um, decide on a, uh, a business deal like that. Do you support a business deal like that with a regime like the Saudis or other countries that have questionable human rights records? As a member of parliament, my first commitment is to the residents of London Fanshawe. And one of the most important things is that we can ensure that people's jobs in London Fanshawe are safeguarded. We've actually invested $3 billion recently to General Dynamics and it's because we believe that these jobs are important to Londoners who are working here. I believe that we have a global responsibility when we're working with uh, our global partners to ensure that they are upholding um, the, the, the rights of their citizens. The important thing is that we also recognize the sovereign decisions that these countries make. And our, our goal, my goal would be to make sure that these jobs here in London, Canada are protected and Londoners continue to have their jobs. Thank you very much. Now to Bella Kosoyan of the PPC. Uh, so, I, like I said, that uh, PPC wants to cut taxes. If we're going to cut taxes and we're going to incorporate welfare tax, we're going to cut, we're going to have more jobs. So, if we're going to have more jobs, so on the international stage, for example, we are going to uh, we are going to work with our allies and maintain international peace. We don't want to be involved in any conflicts. 
and uh, we have to work together with our Un United States partners, and we want to withdraw from United Nations Migration Compton and Paris Accord from on climate change. We want to liberalize trade with other countries, save billions of dollars to focusing on Canadians. International assistance, we are going to be involved when it's needed. Thank you very much. Now, Lindsay Matheson with the NDP. Canada has an obligation to ensure that any arms that we send abroad are not used to violate human rights or undermine international peace and security. Uh, Saudi Arabia is one of the world's worst violators of human rights uh, and has devastated neighboring Yemen. But doing the right thing cannot uh, impact workers negatively. No jobs should be lost through this. Uh, we applaud the government's decision to bring forward uh, the contract, the $2 billion contract for light trucks to GDLS. However, we've been asking them to do that for over two years and pushing them to ensure that those government contracts that they've known about uh, could go to, to GDLS. And it, it's sad that that contract specifically was announced just before a general election. Um, we believe that we will, uh, we could buy the labs that exist and sell them to our forces or sell them to another jurisdiction where they would not violate our fundamental obligations to respect and uphold human rights everywhere. I believe that we can stand up for Canadian jobs and stand up for human rights together. Thank you very much. Michael Van Holst now from the Conservative Party. Thank you. We import billions of dollars of oil from Saudi Arabia, so canceling the contract would create a $15 billion trade deficit. So rather than decide what to do about the contract, let's look at the situation uh, that preceded it and realize that uh, if Canada was energy self-sufficient, we wouldn't be holding to other countries. We, we would be able to uh, make decisions about uh, trade uh, much more easily and much more freely. So I'm thrilled that a Andrew Scheer has decided for us to become energy self-sufficient by 2030 and to build an energy corridor through the, through the nation. This will give us an opportunity to use Canadian oil at home and, uh, and free us from those uh, foreign obligations. Thank you very much. Tom Colnell of the Greens. The Green uh, Party platform uh, uh, stipulates quite clearly that they would cancel contracts uh, with Saudi Arabia and stop importing oil. Now, uh, that's easy to say uh, when you've got hundreds of good jobs on the line here in London Fanshawe. And I would work uh, tirelessly to make sure that those contracts were replaced with new contracts. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing about uh, uh, Saudi oil, we would stop importing oil from Saudi Arabia and use our own oil as we are weaning ourselves off oil in the next 10 years. So those were the two policy issues. But I do think that uh, we do have to protect good jobs that we have them, but it cannot come at the cost of uh, human rights. Um, it's, it's imperative, especially now, that uh, we emerge as good global citizens. Thank you very much. And our second question for in this portfolio is from Sarah May Chitty, and our first response will come from Bella Kosodian of the PPC. So Saudi Arabia is definitely rife with human rights violations, but I'm sure you guys can guess what question I am about to ask. Earlier this year, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls uh, report concluded that there is currently genocide of Indigenous peoples occurring in Canada due to lack of action and poor policy on behalf of the government. Um, I was wondering if each of you could speak to uh, your party's commitments to any of those recommendations made in the report, briefly outline any actions or starts to that decolonizing process. Repeat, please. Question. <laughs> again, just slowly. I don't, I don't know if I can do it uh, as succinctly again. Um, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls report concluded that there is genocide against Indigenous peoples in Canada. So I was wondering if you could speak to your party's commitments to any of those recommendations made in the report, or briefly outline any actions or starts to the decolonizing process. Like I told it, our party recognizes that injustice we are down to indigenous people, and but we have to live in harmony to be able to live together. So as you know that 
I am Armenian by my origins, and my people were the head of genocide and from 1950 to 21. So there is a legal definition of genocide, how groups are targeted and everything. So we have to recognize that injustice was done to indigenous people. We have to live together and we have to work together as Canadians to recognize everything. Thank you very much. Now Lindsay Matheson with the NDP. Um, full implementation of the United uh, Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and enshrining it legally binding in law. Um, uh, human rights is, is also about the right to housing and the right to uh, education and the right to, to clean water. And we've talked a lot about of those things this evening, but it, again, it, it is about that full commitment of, of putting forward those um, into the legally binding um, commitments that we have, uh, and absolutely a full rep uh, implementation of the the calls to action from murdered and missing Indigenous women inquiry, and a full implementation of the the calls from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Thank you very much, Michael Van Holst of the Conservative Party. Thank you. I, re I reviewed that report again, and. Uh, it's, it's almost heartbreaking to see the number of calls for justice in that and how broken the system is and how it, how it doesn't help. Uh, the Conservative Party supported the, the report but, and wanted it to be, to bring a resolution and, and peace and answers to the indigenous people. Uh, it, there was a quest to extend it Another, another two years. Unfortunately, that wasn't granted. We might have got some more robust solutions from that, but certainly the, the, the commitment that we need to make are not only to, as we said, housing and, and health care and, and, and clean water, but uh, the, the justice. And allowing, allowing the indigenous people to be able to... All right, Tom, call with the Greens. Um, uh, the first step is to use the word genocide and always use the word genocide when addressing this issue. Um, I would like to point to just two calls to action um, uh, from all of the calls to action. One is the call to Canadians. Um, it's a direct call about our responsibility in the truth and reconciliation process about how to be a good ally. Um, uh, the second one is specifically about um, uh, indigenous uh, people and resource development and the importance that any resource development be in consultation um, with indigenous people. The colonial mindset forever has seen indigenous lands and indigenous bodies as there for colonial profit and pleasure. And that colonial mindset has to stop. Uh, we need to begin the process of decolonizing. Thank you very much. Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. Yes, I will respond to the national calls for justice for all governments. I will also make sure that I can respond to these calls to actions by engaging and developing a national action plan which aligns with the Liberal government to move forward to reduce violence against women and girls and the indigenous and LGBTQ2I. Uh, because this is something that we have to commit to doing. It's long overdue. And this is part of our, uh, our strategy, but also part of our responsibility as Canadians. Thank you very much. OK, that concludes that topic. We are into our last, which is electoral reform. And our one question in this round comes from Craig Needles. And we will start with a response from Lindsay Matheson of the NDP. Four years ago, Justin Trudeau famously said that the 2015 elect election would be the last under first past the post. As you may have noticed, yeah, good laugh line. Uh, as you may have noticed, uh, the 2019 election that we are currently in the midst of is a first past the post election. So it seems as though the truth was not necessarily told four years ago. Do you think that the first past the post system is broken and needs to be changed like Justin Trudeau used to? <laughs> well said. 
Um, yes, absolutely. I think that there are a lot of things that um, don't allow people to truly feel that they're participating within the first past the post system. Uh, an NDP government will bring in mixed member proportional representation within our first mandate. Uh, we have committed to establishing an independent citizens assembly to recommend the first, the best way to put that into place. And um, Canadians will have the opportunity to experience that new voting system, compare it to the old one, and then we'll hold a referendum to confirm their choice. Um, it was really quite a shame. Um, a lot of people put a lot of work and time and, and their opinions into the committee report over a five-month period. A lot of money was spent to do that, only for Justin Trudeau, unfortunately, to say, nope, doesn't work for me. It won't provide the results that I need. And so all those commitments that I made to you throughout 2015 don't mean a thing. Thank you very much. Michael Van Holst of the Conservatives. Uh, thank you. As you know, we implemented some electoral reform in London, but I was at the big meeting that the federal government put on in, in London about uh, the new ways of uh, possibly uh, electing members of parliament. And the first thing I would say is that if we make a change in that, it has to be done by a referendum first, because that's a, that's a significant change. Uh, I also realized that uh, BC and PEI had referendums on proportional representation and they, they turned those down. So there may not be a mandate there. However, uh, a conservative government would first allow a referendum so the people can decide how they want their members of parliament elected. Thank you very much. Tom Cull of the Greens. Uh, so the Green Party would like to make good on that promise of four years ago. We will definitely uh, bring in, um, uh, we will definitely get rid of first past the post to bring in uh, um, mixed proportional representation or proportional, we're not really sure which one yet. Uh, but it's quite clear that first past the post produces a system where you have two parties and you swing back and forth between those two parties and they spend most of their mandate destroying what the other one built. You don't move forward together as a country when that happens and you don't let new um, ideas rise. Um, you have a party that has got uh, 54, currently 54% uh, of the seats making all of the decisions. That's not a democracy. Thank you very much. Now we go to Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. All of my colleagues have been walking door to door for the past several months, and we've been listening to Londoners in London Fanshawe. And I'm sure we all have ideas of how we can fix things that are broken, and we want to put those ideas to best use. But the important thing is to listen to Londoners and to listen to Canadians. And while the Liberal government acknowledges that the electoral process as we have it is not without fault, we also recognize that after consulting with Canadians from coast to coast to coast, we realized that there wasn't a clear alternative. And putting a referendum into place without any clear alternatives is not in the best interests of Canadians. What we have done in the meantime is we've created greater transparency around uh, campaign uh, fundraising. We've also strengthened our democratic uh, institutions against cyber attacks, and we will continue to build on our electoral system as we move forward. Thank you very much. Bella Kosoyan of the uh, PPC. PPC does not have platform on electoral reform because we have more important stuff to do. We have to balance budget during two years. Our debts are skyrocketing, $2.2 trillion. We have to make that we don't pay for supply management uh, a lot of money for their essentials. X for X, we're paying 150% and for butters, 300%. So we have to cut taxes, we have to bring jobs, and we have to take care of our health care that every Canadian has a time when it can be treated properly. So this is more important stuff when we are going to be elected, when we'll balance the budget, when jobs are going to be created, and when Canadians are going to have more money after we are going to speak about electoral reform. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So we have made it through all of our topics. Well done. Uh, we are now going to have 45 seconds per candidate for them to give a closing statement to you, the people of Lond London Fanshawe. Uh, it's their kind of last chance to bring their message home to you, and we will go in reverse order from the way we started. That means we will begin with Tom Cull of the Greens. And you can just sit at your, sit at your spot. We'll save some steps. We'll, we'll let everyone sit. 
Okay, well, I want to thank my fellow candidates and thank the people of London Fanshawe who have for the past many months, um, you know, shared with us um, their concerns, their visions for a better future. I believe that the challenge we f challenges that we all are facing are massive opportunities to transform our lives for the better. For years, we've switched back and forth between two parties that spend a great deal of their mandate destroying what the other has built. This will not do. This October, the power is in your hands to plot a new course. When you step into that voter's box, I urge you to listen to that inner voice of hope and optimism. It's time to vote for what you to believe in. It's time to vote green. Thank you very much. Michael Van Holsnell of the Conservatives. Thank you. Many voters face a decision that's difficult and uncomfortable, but not complicated. Justin Trudeau, who is not as advertised, has set our country on the wrong course and wants us to go forward. Um, the alternative is Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives, who fortunately have a real plan to protect our environment, a plan to keep, our, keep us within our means, to put more money in your pocket, and to help Canadians get ahead. I hope that you'll support the Conservatives, Andrew Scheer, and myself to do these things. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Lindsay Matheson now with the NDP. Uh, thank you so much for your attendance tonight and to the people of London Fanshawe and uh, fellow candidates and to the panel as well. Thank you so much for your time. Conservative and Liberal governments have used their time and power to help people across Canada uh, or to help people across Canada, um, not by taking action, um, and they've allowed stagnating wages, skyrocketing housing costs, unaffordable childcare, crushing student debt, ballooning prescription drug prices, and a climate crisis to occur. They have chosen not to address these issues, government after government after government. But now Canadians have a choice. You can, make, you can have a government that makes those different choices, that puts those different priorities first, that makes courageous choices that positively impact you, your family, and your community. Thank you very much, Bella Kasoyan of the EPPC. This fall election is game changer. It's going to determine if radical changes we have witnessed on all levels, social, political, and economic, are going to become permanent at the expense of our children and future generation. We understand that government that tries to please everybody will end up please nobody. This is why we want Canadians to have great say and a greater role in their own affairs. The People's Party of Canada wants to return a basic freedom, smaller government in Ottawa, more prosperity for all provinces, and less tax so you have more control over your own money spent. It's time for Canadians to take back their country and restore common sense on 21st of October. In conclusion, I would like to say, together we are strong and free. Thank you. Thank you. And Mohamed Hamoud of the Liberals. I thank the panelists, I thank you, and I thank my colleagues. At the end of the day, the decision is clear. We can either move forward on building on the economy that is booming, over a million jobs have been created, 900,000 Canadians have been lifted out of poverty. This is the track record that the Liberal government has to show for the past four years. Here in London Fanshawe, we need to see the same prosperity that we see elsewhere in Canada and in other neighbourhoods in London come to London Fanshawe. On October 21st, I ask you to elect the voice that will represent you in Ottawa and amplify your concerns. On October 21st, I ask you to look at our track record and to bring that to London Fanshawe so that I can work for you. Thank you very much. So that concludes the first Aeolian Talks all-candidate debate of the 2019 campaign. Uh, this was, of course, for London Fanshawe. Thank you so much to all of you for being here this evening, joining us. Thank you to our candidates, our media panelists, all of our volunteers, the Rogers crew who's here tonight filming. Uh, this will be broadcast throughout the campaign, I believe starting on October the 6th, which is Sunday. It goes into heavy rotation as we head up, uh, lead up into the uh, election on the 20th. First, I'll ask that our panelists and our candidates stay on the stage because we're going to take some pictures, probably for the gram. We'll get it on social media and all that good stuff. Thank you again for your time this evening to everyone who put this together, Andrew Rosser, for all of your dedication and hard work. Thank you again to our candidates. It was a pleasure being here tonight with all of you. Have a safe journey home, and uh, remember to vote on October 21st. Thank you so much. Thank you.